this content triggers you, you'll never survive the end times. The Deep End. Get intimately acquainted with the gospel of your salvation. for climate change. Yes, it's a thing. Politics and religion intersect in strange ways today. And what will your teen learn from college or university? They will learn all about the wonderful contributions of Karl Marx. So I want to tell you about them before they come home this summer and lecture you. This is your favorite night of the week. Welcome to the Deep End on Tim Hatch Live. Yeah! Season 5, episode 5. We have finally made it to episode 5. I know, I always, I don't know, I'm weird. I like it when it's the same season and the same episode number. So, (laughs) season 5, episode 5, Harmony, right? Harmony. Welcome in, everybody. 7.30 Tuesday night. What are we doing? We're doing The Deep End. The Deep End is where we talk about news, culture, politics, and social commentary. Tomorrow night, of course, is the deep is the deep dive. Don't miss that as we continue through our study of the book of Romans. Yeah, we'll be picking it up where we left off, Romans two seventeen, right around there. Boom. So that's tomorrow night. But today, tonight is the deep end, and I am so excited about the content today. And I got a lot to talk about. I want to make sure though that you are checking us out on YouTube.com, especially youtubecom slash Live. That's where we want you to go. That's where we want you to subscribe. Okay, so as usual, as always, click that like button, click that subscribe button, give the beard some love, and click that notification bell. Bring That way you know when we're live. Like right now, I could be watching myself from last week on my phone. Isn't that cool? So anyway, we want you to be subscribed at the YouTube channel. Uh, also, there's... All kinds of goodies on TimHashLive.com, and you can get the book that I put out called Move, Entering into God's Promises. And if you have the book, please do me a favor, leave a five-star review online for me, please, at Amazon.com. And then you can get our Tumblr, which I have right here next to me. Woo. And t-shirts, Deep End t-shirts. We are also on Rumble, and that is happening more and more, uh, growing more and more on our channel the Rumble channel, timpatchlive.com slash rumble. So make sure you also help us out because that costs money to put that content up there for you guys to watch on Rumble. Cash app, the cash tag timpatchlive or timpatchlive.com slash support. I thank you for contributing anything that you can. Now let's get into it, right? Time for Deep End News. Deep End News. News and views that don't make us news. Okay, so the news of the day is that politics and religion... They say these things shouldn't mix and that you shouldn't talk about them. Well, we talk about both on this channel. But I think that it's important that you consider that it happens on both the right, the political right, and the political left. Now, the media, the news, the news lords love to talk about the fact that 
90% of Trump supporters were evangelical Christians. And if we could only just get these people awake, they would come to realize how, how full of error they are. <laughs> Guys, it goes both ways, okay? It goes both ways. There are religious zealots, and I mean Christian, or at least professing Christian. Religious zealots on the left, religious zealots on the right. And, and, and I, I get so worked up when it's always like we, they lump evangelicals in with uh, Trump supporters because true evangelicals who believe Jesus is the only way would not deify any political figure. So this week, out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, I bring you Reverend Jonathan Barker. Uh, he has decided that he is going to fast and pray until Congress passes the climate change bill. But he hopes it won't take long. <laughs> this is from thechristianpost.com. He revealed on a Facebook post that he had his last meal of stir-fry vegetables and rice at 4.26 p.m. Saturday after he felt led by God to embark on a period of fasting and prayer for climate change. He says in the article, quote, like Jonah, I feel like I was running in the exact opposite God way, way God wanted me to go. Uh, and I put this fast off. But this morning, like Jeremiah, when I woke up, God put a fire in my bones and I could no longer ignore it. So this afternoon, as I made lunch, I told Ray, I'm supposing that's his wife or his husband. Who knows? He's Lutheran. <laughs> I told Ray what God was calling me to do. Oh, she. Okay. And she encouraged me to follow my heart. Always wonderful when a pastor's wife encourages the pastor who should be preaching God's word to follow his heart. Always wonderful when that happens. Anyway, the article goes on and it says this. Uh, this is from his Facebook post. The parameters of this fast are going to be a little different. I'm hoping the big climate bill will pass on Monday or early this week. Then I'll be done. <laughs> if that doesn't happen, I'm going to take this one week at a time and closely evaluate how I feel each week as I discern whether or not I can continue. Also, if I get to 6% body fat, I will immediately stop fasting, Marco wrote. I would appreciate your prayers for miraculous strength for this fast and quick action in passing this climate bill. Well, it's Tuesday, and I don't think they passed it today. Uh, and I hope he's doing all right up there in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It's going to get cold pretty soon. Nothing else to do up Kenosha other than eat. And I just thought, you know, I just, I just thought I'd put this up there for you there, Pastor Barker. Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Mm, inconvenient words from Jesus. <laughs> Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Yeah, what we do when we fast, we're supposed to shut up about it, not post it on Facebook and apply it to political ideologies. <sighs> Anyway, I just love the fact that he's like, I'm going to take it one week at a time. Imagine if Jeremiah, who he relates himself to, took it one week at a time. Like, Jeremiah's going <laughs> to, Jeremiah's like, yeah, I got this fire shut up on my bones. I'm going to talk about how Babylonians are going to come into the Judean country, and they're going to they're going to obliviate us, uh, and they're going to be a hand of God judgment. And I'm going to prophesy this, and I'll take it out a week at a time. <laughs> like, that's, that's kind of interesting. Anyway. Stop comparing yourself to Jeremiah. Not a good look because the real Jeremiah never stopped prophesying even when he was thrown in prison and he prophesied for 23 years and was hated by everybody. Can we get away though from the idea that all Christians are supporters of Trump? Can we get away from that, please? Yes, Christians are supporters of Trump. Yes, Christians are not supporters of Trump. Christians are not supposed to be on one side or the other. They're supposed to point you to Jesus. They're supposed to talk about him. He's the savior. Amen. But the political left and the media love to point at the political right in society and say, shame on you, shame on you for bringing politics and religion together. Which brings me to the newly minted governor of New York, Kathy Hochul. Kathy Hochul uh, was in a church in Brooklyn this past uh, weekend. Uh, the church is Christian Cultural Center, and I have actually met uh, two of the pastors from this church. I actually was on a missions trip with them in uh, Uganda. And so she took to the pulpit to talk about the need for people to get vaccinated. And I wanted to show you this video. This is kind of interesting. Here she is. That's Kathy Huckle. Oh, she took over from disgraced Governor Andrew Cuomo. And uh, here she goes talking about the need, or actually talking about the pandemic. She says some good things on the, on the beginning. We have to get this community back. And what we went through this pandemic made us stronger. I believe that, especially when I talk to young people who weren't able to have their graduations from high school or a normal life for the last 18 months. I say to them, whatever comes your way in life, 
You are stronger. You are more resilient. God let you survive this pandemic because he wants you to do great things someday. He lets you live through this when so many other people did not. And that is also your responsibility. But how do we keep more people alive? We are not through this pandemic. I wished we were, but I prayed a lot to God during this time. And you know what? God did answer our prayers. He made the smartest men and women, the scientists, nice. the doctors, the researchers. He made them come up with a vaccine. That is from God to us. Not a problem And so we far. must say, thank you, God. Thank you. And I wear my vaccinated necklace all the time to say, I'm vaccinated. Weird. All of you. Yes, I know you're vaccinated. You're the smart ones. But you know oh, there's people out there goes. who aren't listening to God here and what goes. God wants. Ready? You know this. Politics and religion. You know who they are. I need you to be my apostles. Oh, I need you to go out no. and talk about it and say, we owe this to each other. We love each other. Jesus taught us to love one another. And how Stop. <laughs> when a politician asks you to be their apostles, something's wrong. <laughs> talk about a messiah complex. I mean, Trump got excoriated for this stuff. Excoriated for being the the messianic figure of the political right. Here's Kathy Hockle. She's like four weeks into being governor. And now she's claiming Messiah-like status to tell the congregation down there in Brooklyn to be, there, to be her apostles. I don't want to hear another word about evangelicals and Trump support. I don't want to hear another word about it because, because <laughs> there's political pandering in the religious right and the religious left. And then she goes on in this video and she talks about, you know, racial justice and all that kind of stuff because the church is obviously, uh, no, not, not because it's obviously, because the church is predominantly a black church and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, pandering, pandering. I told my church this past Sunday, there will never be a politician in the pulpit of our church because we're not here to point people to politicians. We're here to point people to Jesus. But it's amazing how often churches on the political left get away with it. They have Hillary Clinton preach. They have Kathy Hockle preach. They have uh, Democratic leaders preach all the time and no one says a word but evangelicals and Trump. Evangelicals and Trump, that's the problem. These, these Bible-toting, gun-toting evangelicals. I mean, hypocrisy hypocrisy uh anyway from the article uh she also says this or actually this actually is in the article there prior to addressing the congregation kathy hockel who was catholic was introduced by the reverend a.r bernard again i met his uh co-pastor there the forty thousand member church's leader and political kingmaker as a person of faith bernard said that he had a pleasure of meeting hockel when she was running for lieutenant governor and it quote struck me as that she was a person of faith really liked her spirit we got a chance to know each other to a to a degree um, these pastors, too, that ignore the fact that people like Kathy Hockle are the most pro-abortion politicians on the face of the earth. How, how can you like the spirit of a politician who wants to make sure that we can continue to murder children in the womb? How can you possibly like the spirit? How can you do it? I, 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 don't, I don't know where that comes from, but it does not come from the scriptures. It's time to start calling these people out, these, these pastors who pander to religious to religious people, kingmakers. We, 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 uh, we've got to call it out. So that's what's happening. Anyway, that's Deep End News. Do me a favor, if you will. I've asked you this before. I want to ask you one more time. Leave a review on our podcast app. I would appreciate it. And uh, give it a five-star review, if you would, wherever you're listening to this from, especially on Apple Podcasts. It helps with all the algorithms getting us bumped up higher and higher and higher. Okay, uh, let's get into something now. We're going to shift gears, and i got a new segment for you today. There's, um, there's a great quote from one of my favorite sitcoms in the last uh, 20 years. The sitcom is The Office. The character is Michael Scott. And Michael Scott once said these words, quote, Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you're getting the best possible information. <laughs> I love that. By the way, back, back in July, the uh, Wikipedia's co-founder says the site is now, quote, propaganda for left-leaning establishment. This is from the New York Post. That's Larry Sanger. He's one of the co-founders of Wikipedia. <sighs> anyway, so 
when it comes to Wikipedia, this crazy notion that everything that anybody can basically adjust and edit is valid and true is amazing. I was on Karl Marx's Wikipedia page, and I was amazed at some of the inaccuracies. And so I thought, let me, let me go and do my own research, and let me lead you guys into the truth about some of these articles that have been shifted from facts and pushed upon you in the name of political ideologies. And with that in mind, I bring you to a brand new segment here on the Deep End. It's called the Deep End Opedia. <laughs> I love that. Okay, Karl Marx, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps no one in history has more impact on the last 150 years of political ideology and cultural controversy than this man. Quick facts, everybody. Uh, millions dead. Cities destroyed. Plagues, famines, starvations, gulags, prison camps, and the deification of the state. All the results of Karl Marx's theories. A failure to be sure. Yet today, if you put your child in a public university or college, and even many private universities or colleges, there is a tremendous chance that they will be taught the radical ideas of Karl Marx in subversive ways, and he will be heralded as a hero. This from Mark, this is from marketwatch.com. The title of the article, quote, Karl Marx is the most assigned economists in U.S. college classes. What? Does anybody remember the Cold War? Communism, capitalism, or as I like to say, state-sanctioned dictatorship and free market economy where you get to call the shots in your life? That over the last 100 years, it was the freedom-loving, freedom-giving governments that actually won the day? But today, here we are. 2020, 2000, this is actually from 2016. Karl Marx is the most assigned economist in U.S. college classes and institutions. So put your child in a university in this country and they will be taught about things like wealth redistribu redistribution, economic justice, the evils of capitalism, the poisonous roots of America's founding, and you will ignorantly send your Christian child to these universities and they will come back hating this country, despising your views and lecturing you and trying to convince you to become a vegan. <laughs> this is the full list, by the way, from 2016 of the most frequently used works in colleges and institutions. Right at the top, again, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. Skip down a few. You get to uh, Paul Krugman, Economics. You skip down even further. Uh, Milton Friedman is one that you actually want your children to read and to learn from. Milton Friedman, a staunch free market scientist or researcher. He is worth the read. The communist ideals of Karl Marx were enacted by leaders like uh, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong of China. So Stalin, Lenin, Russia, Mao Zedong, China. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we already talked about this, you had the USA, Britain, much of the Western European nations which believed in free market capitalism, free market economies, really. In 1989... After hundreds of millions of deaths by plague, famine, poverty, government brutality, communism fell in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union, while America and the West enjoyed unprecedented prosperity and wealth across the board. But amazingly, at the same time communism was falling in Eastern Europe and, and Soviet Russia, the New York Times publishes this article, same year, two months later, literally, quote, the mainstreaming of Marxism in U.S. colleges. Uh, hear this again, that our universities, as communism was proving to be a failure in 1989, were mainstreaming Marxism in the educational system of America's institutions. This, this is incredible. Because if you think about it, it's completely devoid of historical facts. And it has taken root in our, uh, our schools to the extent that the University of Maine offers a, quote, Marxist and socialist studies curriculum that encourages students to look at the world from a variety of Marxist and socialist perspectives. Many departments offer approaches that have their foundation in the work of such economic theorists as Adam Smith, political philosophers uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke. Such approaches seem to assume that capitalist values are neutral according to human nature. 
progressive, just, or simply the only way that rational people would view the world. Marxist and socialist perspectives challenge such, such assumptions and judgments and, and such a world outlook. This is the University of Maine offering a minor degree in Marxist and socialist studies and questioning the very underpinnings of our economic system here in the United States. Amazingly, on the 200th anniversary of his birth, Karl Marx's birth, that is, the New York Times published an opinion piece called Happy Birthday, Karl Marx, You Were Right. The Economist magazine published a piece called Rulers of the World, Read Karl Marx. This is completely disconnected from human history. Today, Karl Marx is heralded as some sort of hero by the educational elites. A guy who stood against the detrimental effects of the Industrial Revolution, a selfless fighter for the little guy whose philosophies were rejected in America because they threatened the privilege of the 1%. So it begs the question, and I'm going to give you the answer. Who is Karl Marx really? And what will the universities not tell your children? That's what I'm going to talk about today. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because I'm reading a fabulous book called Intellectuals by Paul Johnson. And Paul Johnson is a very reputable historian. This is a New York Times bestseller from way back, 2007. But in this book, Paul Johnson exposes the life and the spirit behind many of the influential figures, the intellectuals of the 19th and 20th centuries, these people who are heralded voices of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. One of the chapters deals exclusively with Karl Marx, and you won't believe what he shares in this book. So I'm going to give you some highlights, and then I'm going to give you some facts from some other articles that we looked up here on the Tim Hatch Live team, because this is why you come to this channel. You need facts. What your university class will not tell your child. Karl Marx, he was born Jewish. Uh, his father converted the family to Protestantism after the Jews were restricted from public or high office following a Prussian degree in, a decree in 1816. Uh, his father was the son of a rabbi and his mother was the son of a rabbi. And when his parents saw that the economic advantages of being Christian were, were present, they just converted, not out of conviction, but out of economic interests to Protestantism. I think they converted to Lutheranism. They were in Germany, so it's most likely Lutheranism. Marx was confirmed at age 15. Evidence suggests that for a while he was a pretty devout Christian. But as he grew older, he began to grow more and more skeptical of the working conditions that the capitalistic or quote unquote free market structure of his country provided. And so at the same time he's starting to question how society runs economically, he becomes intensely anti-Semitic. This is a fact. I'll give you one of the quotes from the book, actually. One of the quotes from the book, he says, quote, let us consider the real Jew, not the Sabbath Jew. I'm talking about the everyday Jew. Money is the jealous God of Israel, besides which there no other God may exist. And then, he, and then Johnson writes this. The money Jew had become the universal antisocial element of the present time, and to make the Jew impossible, it was necessary to abolish the preconditions, and by that he means the economic system, or the very possibility of the kind of money activities which produced him. I want you to hear what he says in that quote. He's saying that Jews are the problem because they know how to have money and run the money system, and we need to eliminate them and their preoccupation with money in order to have a revolution that benefits the poor and the disadvantaged. Wow. Interesting how he was Jewish and came to hate his own people. He's, he claims to be this champion of the working class. Did you know that he never actually had a job? Johnson writes that he had intermittent journalist jobs, never really made that much money, and then he never really attempted to get a job because he decided that he was going to be a philosopher. How did he support himself? Well, his parents were rich. He inherited a substantial sum of money from his father when he died, 6,000 gold francs, a, a tremendous amount of money. He also inherited more money when his mother died later in life. Yet, un amazingly, he never held on to money. He was constantly going into debt. 
with many, many debtors, and he never repaid anything that he owed. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, materialistic, spent all kinds of money on all kinds of frivolous things. And Johnson writes this in the book. This is a direct quote, by the way. Still more central to his anger and frustration, and lying perhaps at the very roots of his hatred for the capitalist system, was his grotesque incompetence in handling money. As a young man, it drove him into the hands of moneylenders at high interest rates. And a passionate hatred of usury was the real emotional dynamic of his whole moral philosophy. Don't miss that, guys. What he's saying there is because he couldn't handle money and he never had enough money to to subsidize his lifestyle, he ended up just hating the system that put him in that situation. Man, that sounds a lot like AOC. That sounds a lot like some of the progressive socialist, democratic socialists in our government right now. Blame the system. Blame the system. While I go in debt in the number of, in the terms of $140,000 for a bachelor's degree in gender studies, which won't give me a job. And when I can't get a job and I'm in serious debt because of it, I'll just blame the system and expect a politician to bail me out. Interestingly enough, he actually bummed most of his life off of Frederick Engels. That was his uh, good friend, confidant, and fellow socialist reformer in Germany. Basically lived off him. And many of his quotes, this is fascinating, many of his most famous quotes were actually stolen from others. Uh, Religion is the opium of the people. That's not from Karl Marx. That's from a philosopher named Heaney. Or this quote, from each according to his abilities to each according to his means. Not Karl Marx. That's Louis Blanc. Or quote, "Workers workers of all countries unite. That's from Karl Scraper. What Marx did was gather all these quotes up and make them his own. By the way, for a man who claimed to be fighting for the brutal conditions of the working class, did you know that he never actually visited a factory or a working conditions environment of which he wrote extensively? He never even visited. He never checked it out. Much of his data, Johnson writes about this in the book, much of his data was taken from Friedrich Engels, a friend and fellow German socialist revolutionary who put Marx's writings into publication after his death. Engels' researches on the working conditions of Britain and Germany were outdated. They were unreliable. And he cherry-picked certain facts from working conditions in factories that had already been reformed because of legislation from the 1830s. In other words, they identified the problems before these guys started writing about them. They solved them with legislation, by the way, backed up by the factory heads and owners so that they could maintain and retain good employees. They fixed up the working conditions. And then Marx gets up on the scene, cherry picks data from outdated data from the early 1800s to paint this dark picture of the working environment for 1800s Britain's and Germans. This is how you start a revolution, friends. You pick and choose whatever facts you want. Going on in more more stats about Karl Marx, uh, he endorsed violence for political revolution. In December uh, 1882, he exulted at his glowing influence in Russia, saying, it gives me great satisfaction that I damage a power which, next to England, is the true bulwark of the old society. In other words, as he watched Russia descend into dictatorial fascism, he was happy about it. He also wrote, quote, We are ruthless and ask no quarter from you. When our turn comes, we shall not disguise our terrorism. Far from opposing the so-called excesses, those examples of popular vengeance against hated individuals or public buildings... Uh, July 2020 in America, which have acquired hateful memories. We must not only condone those examples, but lend them a helping hand. In other words, burn, pillage, and destroy in the name of the revolution. (laughs) Perhaps most astonishingly and most secretive to all the educational elites of our society, Karl Marx had a tragic family life. No, not the family he was born into, the family that he created with his wife. He raised his children in abject poverty. Only three of his children survived to adulthood, and his two grown daughters committed suicide. One committed suicide through a suicide pact with her husband. He never paid his live-in nanny. This guy who fought for the little man had a live-in nanny, and he never paid her a dime. 
Amazingly, and perhaps most astonishingly, he sired an illegitimate son through his unpaid live-in nanny and later abandoned him. His name is Frederick de Muth. And now if you go to the Wikipedia page, they'll question that fact. The, re- the reality is, though, even the New York Times reported on what Marx hid. Talking about Frederick de Muth, his illegitimate son, that he sired through his unpaid live-in nanny. When Karl Marx died in 1883, only about a dozen people showed up at his funeral. And that, my friends, is Karl Marx. In a nutshell, I could go on. I could go on for a long time. He was a hypocrite. He was a violent extremist who failed to care for his own children and abandoned a son that he had out of wedlock. But today, he's praised. He's taught to our children. And that matters. Do you know why that matters? Because as Abraham Lincoln once said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. That's where we are, guys. That's why a federal courthouse was burned down in Portland this past summer in protest of racial justice and equity, and no one bothered to care. This is why young people are increasingly hateful of our country. This is why our government is subversively trying to pass legislation that makes people more and more dependent upon the government. This is why when Nancy Pelosi was talking about a $3.5 trillion spending bill that she so desperately wants to pass, which no one really knows what it's really all about, she talked about it not as economic issues, but as a values issue. Some say, oh, well, what about inflation? It will be paid for. And that's the, the beauty of it, by having those in our, our economy and society who have not paid their fair share, paying their fair share. So again, the Senate and the House, those who are not in full agreement with the president's right, let's see what our value, let's not talk about numbers let's, and dollars. Let's talk about values. The value that she's talking about there is making you dependent on the state for everything. I fear that the European history of the 20th century, the bloodiest and most cruel violent in history, may repeat in American history in the 21st century. We will see. We will see. The question, and I want to pose this to you guys, and then I want to teach you this, is how do you get this kind of revolution society? How do you get a revolution that ends up leading several countries into dictatorial fascist regimes that cost the lives and the fortunes of hundreds of millions of people. Two big things. First, you need a dystopian future to point to, a dystopian future. We've talked about this on the deep end before. Everybody either has a utopian view of the future or a dystopian view of the future. A dystopian view says uh, cataclysm is coming. The apocalypse is coming. (laughs) And we need to change or we're all going to die. So you need things like, oh, I don't know, climate change alarmism. Tomorrow, the world is going to burn up. The sun monster is out to get us. The politicians keep cutting down our time, don't they? 12 years left, eight years left, six months left. A few years back, it was Prince William who said we had eight months left. (laughs) doesn't matter that none of their predictions ever come true. It's a dystopian future that they've got to keep selling you so that you can hire them to fix it. Secondly, you also need revisionist history, and this is what Karl Marx did. So you have to talk about how everything before us was evil, unjust, or in our language of today, racist, patriarchal, homophobic, anti-science. You have to undo the foundations. Like, like Marx with the Jews of his time, you, you have to blame some religious structure to revolutionize society. By the way, Marx was a German philosopher who blamed the Jews for the inequities of the world, or at least the inequities of his country. And less than 80 years later, a man named Adolf Hitler would do the exact same thing. So let's talk about this a little bit more in detail. What does it take to create a revolution? Like I already said, you have to paint a cataclysmic future of human, uh, of the human race. Number two, you have to reimagine history. But number three, you have to blame a specific group of people for all the problems of your nation, such as the rich, or the Christians, or the colonizers, or Western civilization as a whole. A couple of years ago, people were marching on Washington saying, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western civ has got to go. In other words, hate your history. 
hate what made your country what it is and blame people. Blame the 1%. Blame the political supporters of that candidate and blacklist them and cancel them and silence them. This is happening. The Facebook files report from the Washington Journal has, has revealed that Facebook is suppressing only one side of uh, political speech. I'll let you guess which one it is. Then, fourth, you have to cherry pick facts and generate outrage. See, revolutions feed on outrage. And you can only create outrage when you cherry pick facts, such as Engels and Marx did about the working conditions of the working class in the 1830s. Then you have to talk about impossible realities like equity and economic justice. And then ultimately, what it takes to create a revolution is you really have to do nothing because that's what they depend on. They depend on you being ignorant, not knowing the facts, not knowing your history, not being a student of the sciences of economics and how these economic policies have ruined countries before us so they can ruin the country we have. And the signs are definitely present in our universities that this is where we are going. I already talked about the University of Maine, but this article from Forbes magazine, the title of the article, A Marxist Education and Hypersensitivity as a Cause of Violence on American Campuses. So this is, again, from 2016, but nothing has died down since then. And what the article really talks about is the fact that there's this increase in violent protests whenever a speaker that certain students don't like is scheduled to appear on a public university's campus. And this is a direct quote from the article. It says, what has been missed is the role of hypersensitivity and what it can do in the cause of violence. And they, they talk about this book, Roy Baumeister's Evil, Inside Human Cruelty and Violence. And he identifies a number of individual psychological factors on whose basis it is possible to, quote, begin to predict who is likely to be dangerous or violent. Hypersensitive people. Now think about it. hypersensitive people. Think snowflakes. Hypersensitive people who often think their pride is being assaulted are potentially dangerous. He goes on to explain how hypersensitivity to insults also makes it possible to understand what might otherwise appear to be senseless violence. Many violent people believe that their actions were justified by the offensive acts of the person who became their victim. Hypersensitivity. Guess who came up with the idea of hypersensitivity and consciousness raising? This is from the article. goes on. This is not a far stretch from indeed it rises out of the project called consciousness raising. The Marxist inspired term for liberating the oppressed from the quote false consciousness that blinds them to the reality of their in parentheses, capitalist oppression. Once consciousness has been raised, the oppressed can more successfully wage the class struggle that Marx deems to have driven all history. Quote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. End quote, writes Marx in the opening sentence of his Communist Manifesto. In other words, what you have to do, Karl Marx said, is you have to tell people that they've been blinded by the systems and the society that they were raised in or born into. You have to elevate their consciousness to this level of hypersensitivity wherein everything is an insult, everything is an injustice, Justice, everything is in equity so that you can stir them up to hyperaggression and ultimate violence. That's how you produce a communist revolution. That is what our universities are doing to our students right now at the behest of this adulterating, no job having loser from Germany named Karl Marx. Let's talk about the effects of Karl Marx before we're done. <laughs> Three simple realities of Karl Marx's philosophy, state-sanctioned dictatorship, death, and extreme poverty. Again, the most notorious Marx adherents were Vladimir Lenin from Russia, Joseph Stalin, his successor, and Mao Zedong, the communist revolutionary from China. What did they do? They killed and killed and killed. This is from freedomworks.org. Karl Marx's legacy is death. The article reads, estimates vary. But communism is responsible for the death of up to 100 million people, perhaps more. From Joseph Stalin's Great Purge and the Holdemore to Mao Zedong's families, famines, I'm sorry, to Pol Pot's killing fields, the legacy of Karl Marx is one of death. The authors of the Black Book of Communism estimate that deaths by county or region are as follows. China, 65 million deaths. Soviet Union, 20 million. North Korea, 2 million. Cambodia, 2 million. Vietnam, 1 million. Africa, 1.7 million deaths. Afghanistan, 1.5 million. Eastern Europe, 1 million, Latin America, 150,000 deaths. This article from USA Today, 
Don't celebrate Karl Marx. His communism has a death count in the millions. Great article here by James Bovard. I encourage you to go read it. Bovard writes, In 1932, Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin decreed the death penalty for any theft of state property. As millions of Ukrainians were starving due to the brutal collectivization of farms, even children poaching a few ears of corn could be shot. Yet, iron- yet ironically, today's younger generation is taught incessantly that if America does socialism or communism, we'll do it right. What arrogance. You see what happens too here when you have a communist revolution, when the state takes control of property, it's kind of funny. Suddenly stealing's a problem. But while they're getting us there, what do they got to do? They got to steal from some to give to others. <laughs> Let me pose a, hyperbo- a hypothetical situation. Suppose I see my neighbor to my left is a little bit downtrodden and financially hurting, and my neighbor on my right over here, he's well off. And what if I just break into his house, take some of his money, and bring it over to my impoverished neighbor on my left? Now, that's a modern-day Robin Hood, right? But what would happen to me? I'd get arrested. Do you know how I could do that same exact action without getting arrested? Run for political office. That's all I need to do. I just need to get political power, the power of the military behind me then I can do it. And then magically taking money from some and giving it to those who didn't earn it is no longer called theft. It's funny. No wonder why they want the power. No wonder why they want they no wonder why they don't want you to have any guns. Amazingly and most astonishingly, Karl Marx's statues are everywhere still to this day. This one is in Moscow. This one is in Germany. And the funny thing about this one in Germany is it's a gift on the 200th anniversary of his birth from the Chinese government. In other words, Germany was saying, dear, uh, China was saying, dear Germany, thanks for all the bad ideas. Signed, China. This statue is in London. In London! This statue is in a museum. A whole wing of a museum in China dedicated to the philosophies of Karl Marx. Oh, and in Portland, Oregon... While they were tearing down statues of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington last summer, they left this one up, and uh, that's in downtown Portland. By the way, the city is still struggling for tourism because of all of the riots, all of the violence, and all of the problems that they have experienced over the last 18 months. We are losing our minds, and nobody seems to care. (laughs) So, ironically, of all the countries in the world, only five, yes, five, still hold a communist view. Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, China. Anyone want to move there? You might not have to. If the universities continue to do their job, communism will come here. And parents, if you keep sending your students, your children, to these indoctrination camps, you'll contribute to the problem. I'm asking you to do your job, parents. I'm asking you to get involved in your kids' education. Send them to a Christian university. Maybe send them to a trade school and give them something to do with their hands so that they don't start spending too much time thinking about how unfair the world is as they sit in your basement and play Fortnite all day. Maybe send them on a Christian's missions trip. Like I told my church this past week, Before you pay for their college, how about you pay for a missions trip to Guatemala, to El Salvador, to a a country that's really hurting so they can get out of the American bubble and learn a thing or two about the real world. Because I fear that if we don't learn the lessons of history, we will be doomed to repeat it. No one wants to live in those countries. You don't either. And I don't want to see this country become like that. That's the deep end, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I offered you information that you can use. And I hope, most importantly, that you will join me tomorrow for the Deep Dive Bible Study. Back to the Book of Romans. That's tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. Check me out on timhatchlive.com. I'm so glad that you were here. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night on the Deep Dive. God bless you guys. Take care.